Cinderella. Once upon a time, there lived a beautiful girl called Cinderella that lived with her stepmother and her two ugly stepsisters. They were always terrible to poor Cinderella. They made her work all day cleaning the house and cooking for them. Cinderella wore raggy old clothes and slept in a cold, damp room. One day, invitations to the grand ball at the palace arrived in the mail. The stepmother and the two stepsisters were so excited. We must get new dresses and look our very best, they said. When the great day arrived, the stepmother and stepsisters spent all evening getting ready for the ball. Cinderella asked, "May I come as well? You at the ball don't make us laugh. Besides, you need to do the laundry." Her stepsisters shouted. Cinderella sat down and cried. Suddenly, her fairy godmother appeared. Do as I tell you, and you shall go to the ball," her fairy godmother said. "Bring me a pumpkin, six white mice, a brown rat, and six green lizards," said the fairy godmother, and Cinderella did just that. Her fairy godmother waved her magic wand, and in a flash, the pumpkin turned into a coach, the mice into horses, the rat into a coachman, and the lizards into footmen. Then she waved her magic wand again, and Cinderella instantly had a lovely dress and shoes. She looked wonderful. Go to the ball," said the fairy godmother. But you must leave before the clock strikes midnight. Cinderella arrived at the palace on her coach, and everyone was dazzled by her beauty. The prince met her at the door and accompanied her in. She danced all night long with the prince. Then Cinderella heard the clock striking twelve. It's midnight. I must go. She said as she ran down the palace stairs so fast, one of her shoes fell off. The coach, the horses, the coachman, and the footmen were again a pumpkin, mice, a rat, and lizards. So Cinderella ran back home and sat in the kitchen in her old clothes. The next day, the prince was very unhappy. He wanted to find the princess he had danced with. He had found the shoe she had left. And said, "I'll marry the girl who can wear this shoe." The prince visited every house in the kingdom, but he could not find one girl who could wear the shoe. When he arrived at Cinderella's home, the stepsisters tried on the shoe. They pushed and pulled and screamed and cried, but the shoe was just too small for their big, ugly feet. Cinderella then said. May I have a try? The stepsisters mocked her for thinking she could be the princess, but of course the shoe fit perfectly. I have found you," said the prince. "Will you marry me?" "Yes, please," Cinderella replied, and they went to live in the palace where they lived happily together forever. The end. The ugly duckling. On the banks of the canal, in the tall grass, Mother Duck sat on her nest, waiting for her ducklings to hatch. At last, the eggs started to crack. One by one, the little ducklings popped out of the eggs. Chirp, chirp! They cried as they saw the big outside world. Soon, all the eggs had hatched except for one, the biggest of them all. Mother Duck sat on the egg a little longer, and at last the egg started to crack. Out came the chick. "Oh dear," she said, "you don't look anything like any of my other children. You're different." "He's ugly," quacked the other ducklings. "He doesn't look a bit like us. We don't want to play with him." Mother Duck took her ducklings down to the water. One by one, the ducklings followed her. "I bet you can't swim, ugly duckling!" exclaimed one of the little ducklings. 
But soon they were all swimming, even the big ugly duckling, who actually proved to be the best of the swimmers. Yet on the farm, all the animals made fun of the ugly duckling. The chickens teased him, the turkeys bit him, and even his own brothers were mean to him. All because he looked different. The ugly duckling felt sad and alone. One day, when he couldn't stand it any longer, he decided to fly away. He flew over the barnyard fence and on and on, weary and unhappy, until he came to the marsh where the wild ducks lived. But the wild ducks just laughed at him and said, Go away, ugly duckling. Poor little ugly duckling. He ran away over the fields and meadows. It was getting dark and the duckling was so cold and tired. He found a little cottage and knocked on the door. An old woman who lived in the cottage opened the door and said, If you can lay eggs, you can stay. But hard as he tried, he could not lay any eggs. Then I have no use for you. You must go, said the old woman. The duckling walked in the cold for days. He had nowhere to go. One day, some beautiful white swans flew overhead. I wish I was like that, said the duckling. He decided to hide among the reeds in the marsh all through the cold winter months. Then when the warmer months came and the duckling came out of hiding, he felt the sun on his back. He spread his wings, they felt strong, and he flew high into the sky. He flew over the canal and saw some beautiful swans. He landed by the canal and saw himself in the water. He couldn't believe what he saw. He was no longer an ugly duckling but a beautiful swan. He remembered how he had been laughed at and treated cruelly for being different. And now he was different because he was the most beautiful. The other swans invited him to fly with them, and so he did. The little duckling learned that being different isn't always such a bad thing after all. The End the Frog Prince There once was a pretty little princess who lived in a castle near the forest. On hot summer days, she loved to play with her golden ball under the shade of the trees. But one day when she was playing, the ball bounced away and rolled into a deep swamp. The princess began to cry as she saw her ball vanish into the water. Suddenly, an ugly frog appeared and asked, what will you give me if I fetch your ball? My jewels and my crown, the princess replied. No, said the frog. I will only fetch your ball if you promise to love me and let me eat from your plate and sleep in your bed. In agony, the princess agreed to the frog's demands. So the frog dove into the swamp and brought back her golden ball. But as soon as the princess had her ball, she ran off home, leaving the frog alone. The princess quickly forgot about the frog and her promise. But the next day, when she was having dinner with her father, there was a knock at the door. The king answered the door, and there was the frog. He told the king what had happened. You must keep your promise, the king sternly said to the princess. Let the frog onto the table. So the princess had to share her dinner with the frog. But seeing the ugly frog on her plate took her appetite away. When it was time for bed, the king made the princess carry the frog upstairs to her bedroom. The princess didn't want a cold, ugly frog in her bed. But the king demanded it, so she let the frog hop onto her pillow. Now you must give me a kiss good night," said the frog. The princess, in disgust, closed her eyes and gave him the smallest of kisses. But when she opened her eyes, 
the frog had disappeared, and in his place was a handsome prince. He told the princess that he had been enchanted by a witch who had turned him into a frog, and that he had been fated to be a frog until a princess would take him out of the swamp and let him eat from her plate and sleep in her bed. The prince was so grateful that he asked the princess to marry him, and the young princess, as you may have guessed, did not hesitate in saying yes. And as they spoke, a brightly colored coach drove up the castle with eight beautiful horses. The horses were decked with plumes of feathers and a golden harness. The beautiful coach took them to the prince's kingdom, where they lived happily ever after. The end. The Emperor's New Clothes Once upon a time, there was a vain emperor who loved clothes. He made sure he always looked splendid all the time and had a different outfit for every day of the year. One day, two strangers came to town, stating they were weavers and that they could manufacture the finest clothing that could ever be imagined. The word spread quickly and came to the emperor's ears. If they can truly make wonderful clothes, I want to meet them, the emperor said. And so the emperor's footman arranged a meeting with the two strangers. A little round man and a long thin man arrived at the palace, and they bowed before the emperor. Slimus and slick at your service, your highness, they said. I hear you make wonderful clothes. Is it true? the emperor asked. Oh, yes, not only wonderful clothes, but magical clothes, your majesty, Slimus said. Only clever people can see them. Stupid people can't. I have no magical clothes, the emperor thought. I need to have them. Are the clothes splendid? the emperor asked. Oh, very splendid, your highness, Slick replied, but very expensive, as you can well imagine. Take all the gold you want, cried the emperor. Just make me those clothes. One week later, Slimus and Slick returned to the palace to show the emperor the clothes they had made. Here are your beautiful clothes, your majesty. Don't they look splendid? The emperor and all his footmen gulped, because they couldn't see a thing. None of them wanted to seem stupid. So when the emperor said, Splendid! They are splendid! All his footmen agreed. Oh, yes, your majesty, these are by far your most splendid clothes. The emperor decided to wear his magical clothes to the royal procession that very day. Here is your cloak, said Slimus. It's as light as a feather. Oh, your highness, your clothes fit you so well, added Slick. The emperor admired himself in the mirror. Don't I look magnificent? People will talk about me for years to come. Yes, your majesty, everyone agreed, staring at the emperor. Open the palace gates, ordered the emperor, and let the royal procession begin. The crowd gasped when they saw the emperor. Everyone had heard that only clever people could see his clothes, so everyone cried out, How splendid His Majesty looks in his new clothes, and look how well they fit! Of course, no one could see the clothes, but none of them would admit that, because no one wanted to declare himself a fool. Until a small child cried out, The Emperor has no clothes on! Then Everyone looked at each other and began laughing out loud. <laughs> the emperor has no clothes on. The emperor realized he had been fooled by Slick and Slimus and that he was indeed naked. He blushed bright red, but thought it was better to continue the procession under the illusion that anyone who couldn't see his clothes was a fool. He walked stiffly, while behind him a page held his imaginary mantle. As for Slick and Slimus, they had disappeared with all of the gold, never to be seen again. But at least one thing turned out, as predicted by the Emperor. People did talk about him for years to come. 
the end.